Now, what I do want you to do is agree with me in prayer. Typically on a Sunday morning, I pray to myself over here, and I pray something of the nature where, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I rebuke everything that is demonic and unclean, and it would try to cause distraction of that nature. And that is my prayer. What I need you is to be in agreement with me. So say, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we claim this next half hour under the kingdom. Actually, I'm going to make it the next two hours. <laughs> In fact, I'm going to make it the, next, the rest of this day under his kingdom. Amen? Amen. Kevin, I love you. Come on. I'm good. They are not. Thank you. <laughs> well, good morning. Pastor Dave, you are you are awesome, and uh, amen. amen. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> um, you all kind of provoke me to jealousy because you get to you get to have Pastor Dave every week. Um, we no longer have a pastor um, since I was the pastor of a church, and and so um, you know, not that we don't attend church because we do. Uh, but it's just not the same, uh, because the, the church that we're going to, the, the uh, pastor is several years younger than me, and there's times I feel like I'm his pastor, uh, and, uh, and so I just envy you guys that you have this man uh, to be uh, your leader at this time. So God bless you, brother. <laughs> and, uh, and I would be remiss to say that, uh, you know, be behind every man um, is a bunch of space because his wife is in front of him. So, <laughs> so Tammy, you are amazing. So thank you. Amen. So, it, same is the case for me. There's no way I would be here without my wife's permission. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and she has carved a pathway for us to be able to move forward in ministry. There was no way I would ever resign from a church if my wife wasn't okay with that. And, and, and so we communicate in, in, on that level uh, because we, we know that we're partnered in this as, as God is leading us. Amen? Let me pray. Lord, I want to thank you that you are here. <sighs> We're asking you, Holy Spirit, that you would do what's only possible through you. Let's take the words that are being spoken, spoken and translate those into the hearts and minds of your people so they can hear, know, be taught exactly what you want them to hear and know. And so, Lord, I surrender, I submit to you and just simply ask, that you would lead us through this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm excited to be here this week, uh, and, and we got in Thursday night. Um, I'm super stoked about what God is doing in our lives, and I'll explain that in a second. Uh, and, uh, but just trust me, you are going to see the miraculous happen. Amen. amen. The first miracle is me getting done in about 20 minutes. So, <laughs> so if that happens, you know that God is here. So, but we are super excited uh, just to kind of give you a background of, of the journey that we've been on. What's been happening is this. Um, last May, we went on sabbatical. We planted a church over seven years ago, and it was in one of the most diverse parts of Lincoln, Nebraska. Within a five-block radius of our church, there were over 45 different languages spoken. And it was one of the toughest places, and there are the toughest places to plant a church. Uh, and people often said, why are you planting a church there? Because we know this is where God is leading us, and, and we've been prayed for, we've been commissioned, all that. And, and things were great. It was awesome. After seven years of, of dealing with people who really don't know Jesus, these are first-generation Christians that, we were, that were coming into our, our, our congregation, into our community, and it, that was fine. That was great. 
it was when the more seasoned people started coming in when I started getting frustrated. Because y'all can be mean. I mean, I mean, just, I mean um, when, you're, when you've been doing this for a while, there's a language that you speak that most people who are coming to know Jesus don't know the language. And you expect them to know that language. You expect them to know how to behave, and they don't know how to behave. And, and, they, and you get upset with them, they get upset with you, and, and it's just very frustrating. And I'm trying to teach us that we need to walk through this and walk together with them in, in this process as they mature. And, and so I was worn out, okay? After about seven years, three things happened when I went on sabbatical. First one, I was just exhausted. I was fatigued. I was worn out. I was burned out. I didn't realize that until we went on sabbatical. Because what happened during that process in ministry, it's a weird thing. You just grind it out. You just, you just tell yourself, oh, you just need to get over it. Get to the next season. Everything will be okay. But thankfully, I, I was able to get on, go on sabbatical. And I figured out three things. First, I was fatigued. Secondly, I was disappointed. I was disappointed because we spent a lot of time praying. We spent a lot of time pouring into people. We spent a lot of time trying to develop leaders. And one thing after another, when you do all that, when you're spending time with God, hours and hours, we would wake up at 5 in the morning, come to church, and pray for a couple hours. We would spend that time there. And then all of a sudden, oh, I guess for me anyway, I'm not blaming this on you. For me, I was just like, man, there should be a revival happening in Lincoln. Because I'm praying, right? Yes. And, and it wasn't happening. And, and it seemed like things got worse. You ever pray and things get worse? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're laughing because you're like, oh, amen to that. And it's like sometimes you might think your, your, your prayers are cursed because you should, you know, people ask you, can you pray for me? Like, no, you don't want me to do that. <laughs> but I just felt kind of like things were just getting worse. So I was disappointed. And, and I could deal with that. But the third thing was this, I was bored. And that's when it got dangerous. I was bored. And what was I bored with? I was bored with the routine. Every Sunday, well, actually it started Saturday. I'm like, I got to go to church tomorrow. <laughs> and I'd sometimes say to my wife, I said, I want to go to church tomorrow. She's like, what, you have to? I'm like, why? She said, because you're the pastor. I'm like, oh, that's right. And so I was just, I was bored because you give your heart and soul to this. You spend time in the word of God. You spend time praying and you pour out your soul to, to the people of God. And you're like, man, that was a good sermon. And they're like, what you got for me next week? <laughs> you know? And it's like, I'm bored. When I wasn't only bored with that. I was bored with not seeing transformation happen. I was bored with not seeing this connection with the supernatural. We say that we worship God and, and that we invite him into our settings, into our communities, and our time together. But one thing we leave out is him. Let's be honest. Most churches in Western culture, we can do this without God present. And we've created a system where we gather around sermons instead of gathering around the presence of God. Now think about this for a second. If, any football fans in here? All right. Yes. All right. Way to go. Great. Good job, Dave. All right. I'm a huge football fan. I know God loves football too. And I know he loves Michigan. It's his favorite team. Um, <laughs> But think about this. Oh, don't throw the tomatoes yet. And think about this for a second. Would you go to a football game to listen to the coach? No. Matter of fact, I bet most of you probably yeah, tune out when the press conference comes after a game and the coach is up, because, especially if it's Bill Belichick, because he is boring. <laughs> right? And he's just this monitor, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, we won. Well, what would you think of the old kind of, kind of deal? And yet, that's kind of the system, if you will, analogy, that, if, if I can use that, that we portray within church. We're going to pay a guy to be professional to teach us how to think and how to behave. 
And I say behave, but not how to engage and encounter Christ and engage the kingdom of God into this dark world. Because we showed up at we showed up in a football stadium and the coaches went out. I mean, it would kind of be cool to see the coaches fight, you know, especially Jim Harbaugh and Urban Meyer. That'd be fun. Um, that's a Michigan Ohio State reference for those of you who don't know. Anyway, that would be fun. But you don't come for that. You come to see the players engage. Jesus came not for us to be spectators of what he's doing. He came so that he could engage you in what his Father wants to do through you. Let me read something to you. This is from Matthew chapter 14. It says this in verse 13. I'm reading from the NIV if that's okay. When Jesus heard what happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he, com he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him um, and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to, uh, to the villages and buy, them some, buy themselves some food. Jesus re replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them, the disciple, them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who, were, uh, who, uh, who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Um, and later that night, he was there alone. I'm stopping right there for a reason. It's kind of a cliffhanger, if you will. Does any of you know what Jesus did after he stopped, pr stopped praying? I'll, I'll tell you, so you don't have to guess. After he stopped praying, after he spent time alone with God, he went out and walked on the water. You remember that story? Now, this is fascinating. Because most of us can see this, it's this image of Jesus walking out on the water. The disciples were out on a boat. The boat was being tossed and, 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 and driven by the storm. They were about to capsize. They were afraid. Uh, they were panicking. And I'm sure if anybody on that boat was like me, they were blaming Jesus. <laughs> Man, I can't believe he left us out here alone. I'm sure he's back there taking all the credit. He set us up. Because I'm quick to complain when God doesn't come through. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Well, he walks on water. He gets close to the boat. They, it's so close that the people on the boat, the, the apostles on the boat, recognize that there's a figure walking towards them, and they're afraid because they think it's a ghost. Well, Peter does something very stupid. He says, because he hears uh, this voice say, don't be afraid, it's me. Jesus says, well, Lord, if it's you, let me come out on the water. That is dumb. I'm just telling you, because for, for me, I would have said, Jesus, if it's you, just come closer. Right? Yes. Well, before we get to that, what happened there, let's think about what was happening during this feeding of the 5,000. This is so cool. You're going to love this. So during the feeding of the 5,000, here's what happened. Here's the scenario. Jesus has a bunch of followers. There's over 5,000 people here because it's only, it, the Bible tells us it's 5,000 men, not, in, not counting women and children. So some people, some scholars estimate that there might have been about 20,000 people that Jesus feeds on five loaves of bread and two fish. That is amazing. Well, Jesus says, okay, because the disciples, I'm sure they're probably disturbed, di disturbed because, you know, they're the elders of the church. Let's get rid of the people because <laughs> they're getting on our nerves. <laughs> and the pastor, Jesus says, no, wait a minute. Let's do this. Let's feed them. Well, we don't have anything to feed them. And I think this is kind of maybe sarcastic. There's only, Lord, there's only two loaves, there's only two fish and five loaves of bread. Or, 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 and Jesus is like, well, great. That is plenty. 
I didn't even think we had that much. She gave them to me. She prays over them. Now, here's what I believe. I don't believe for one moment, all of a sudden, it all multiplied. What I believe is he gave that to the disciples. He broke it. He gave it. The apostles, <laughs> imagine this. I think Peter would have been fun to hang out with because he's just hilarious. Because <laughs> he's always saying stuff and getting himself in trouble. Here's what I think, here's what I believe happened. Jesus gives it, he breaks the bread, he gives it to him. He said, okay, now go give him something to eat. And they're probably looking like, you know, we had five full loaves. And now we only have part of it. This is never going to work. It reminds me of a time when I was in uh, kindergarten, and we should get graham crackers for snack. Anybody remember that? And I used to always break them up. I'm like, we only get one graham cracker. I'm like, I used to break them up because it felt like it was more. <laughs> and I don't think Jesus was trying to disguise that there was less or more. He breaks it and gives it to him and says, now go. They go, and I'm sure Peter probably walks up to the first 50 that's there and says, okay, take a piece. That's too big. <laughs> but he starts doling it out, and he realizes there's still stuff in his hand. Every time somebody takes a piece, it doesn't diminish what's in his hand. That's what we need to understand. Every time we give something away for the sake of the kingdom, you don't lose anything. And so all of a sudden, it multiplies. They're a part of this interaction. They're not spectators. They're part of what's happening. And they're seeing this miraculous thing, and Jesus is utilizing them because Jesus is telling them, you're not spectators in this. You're participants in what God is doing. And all of a sudden, everybody's fed to the point that they, there's leftovers. Guess how many baskets they took up? Twelve. How many apostles? Well, that's not coincidence, is it? So there they have something real in their mind that they were a part of, they were experiencing, and they saw it happen right in front of them. And then all of a sudden, Jesus dismisses them, and I'm sure at the beginning of it, they're probably on the boat saying, did you see what just happened? Can you believe that? Oh my goodness, was, yeah, mine too. There was stuff in my hand, they took it, and And look, there's baskets full here. We can eat on the way over. Let's use something to catch some fish. Yeah, I'm, I'm taking liberties here. But it's so amazing. And then all of a sudden, Jesus comes walking out on water, and they're afraid because they don't recognize it's him because they got distracted by the storm. There's storms that, comes in, that, that will always come in our lives. We need to understand that Jesus is above the storm. But guess what? He says we are too. Here's the problem that I had when I first read this, the first hundred times. I read this and I saw, oh my goodness, Jesus walked on water, and then he let Peter do that too. That's, that's pretty cool. But you know something? Of course Jesus walked on water because he's Jesus, Right? Well, this is what Jesus chose to do when he came. He chose to limit his deity. He chose that. But what he also chose to do was demonstrate what life could be like for us if we listen to what the Father's telling us. See, when we listen to what the Father's telling us, we now engage within the supernatural, and supernatural things occur through ordinary people. That's why Peter was able to walk on water. Now, we think this is a stupid comment that Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come out, but it's really not. If you go back, when, when Jesus first tells Peter to come follow him, here's what happens. Peter is on the shore. He's washing his net. Jesus jumps into a boat. He starts preaching, and he's, Peter's listening to the authority that's coming from the voice of God, and he's hearing this, and then P Jesus gives him another invitation that's going to challenge the very fiber of his being. He said, now, hey, let's go back out, and let's go fishing again. Peter's thinking, and he says this, we've been out all night, because that's when you catch fish. You do it at night. You don't do it during the day, Jesus. Jesus. 
But he says, nevertheless, if you say so, I'll go out. They go out. He says, throw, cast your net. He casts his net. Guess what happens? The biggest catch of his life. So much so, other boats have to help him, and they pull to the shore, and Peter's like, oh, no, Lord, get away from me. I'm an evil man. So that's the beauty of an encounter with Christ. When you encounter Christ, when you have an encounter with God, and every single one of us need to have an encounter with God, every single individual in this room needs to have an encounter with God. Not an experience, an encounter. Because once you encounter God, you now realize how desperate you are. And how much you need him. See, we can live on other people's experiences, but you cannot live on somebody else's encounter. You have to have your own. And so when we encounter Christ, and, and Peter encountered Christ in that moment, he says, get away from me. I'm an evil man. Jesus says, don't worry about this, bro. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Wow. Now, fast forward. He's on the boat. Why would Peter say at that moment, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come out? You know why? Because Peter began to understand when he was first called, I can trust what Jesus says. So he says, Lord, if you say so, bid me to come. If you say it, I'm going to take you at your word, and I'm getting out of the boat. And he does it. He walks on water, not as a spectator, but a participant. Here's what's going to happen this, this today. We are being invited to be participants in God's glory. All of you. We're going to have a service tonight where we're going to see God move in such a, a mighty way. And you're going to be a part of it. It's not the professional. I'm just here to guide you through it. It's been an awesome, awesome journey so far. We've seen so much happen. I've seen God do more within the last nine months than I have in the 25 years of ministry prior. It's been incredible. One last story, and I'll land this plane. I was speaking at a, a, a youth camp. Showed up on a Friday night. This kid walks in. He has a severe lazy eye. I look at him, I notice him right away. He's sitting across the room facing me, and I'm looking at him and saying, oh, man, Lord, is there anything you're going to do for that young man this weekend? That's my prayer. And I just left it there. I just put it out in the atmosphere and just left it there. Didn't think any more about it. Second day, we were there. We're, we, uh, we shared the gospel. We, we taught the kids how to hear from God, and, and we were having an exciting time. Kids were listening. They were hearing God. They were responding to, to what God was saying. And then the, the Saturday Eat our afternoon. Um, I'm, I'm sharing again, and and uh, and I said we're going to do a time of ministry right now, and they, and they're kind of looking at what does that mean? What does that mean? I said here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray for people to for for them to be healed, and and so I said is anybody in this room experiencing any sort of pain in their body at all? There's probably about ten kids that stood up that and had pain in their body. And one of the counselors was there. She couldn't. She had uh, deafness in one of her ears, and uh, there was like 80% hearing loss in the right ear, and like 60% uh, in her left ear. So we prayed for her, and as we're praying for her, she looks at me. She says, "I felt a pop." I said, "That's awesome." I said, well, "What else happened?" She said, "I can hear everything you're saying." Praise Jesus! Isn't that cool? Yes. And so kids are being prayed for, kids are being healed. This kid with the, with the lazy eye, he's sitting in the front row, raises his hand. I said, what's up, man? He said, hey, I don't believe anything you're doing. I ex who let you in here? <laughs> and he says this, I'm only going to believe you if you fix my eye. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, crap. Everybody's looking like, yeah, he's going to fix his eye. I'm like, man, you know, there's times you just wish you could punch a kid, you know, and, like, <laughs> and not get in trouble for it. So anyway, I tell him, I said, I said, come up here. And he comes up, and he's facing me like you're the audience. He's, he's looking towards me. And I said, what did you just say? He said, I'll only believe you if you can fix my eye. I said, wow, that's awesome. Yeah. 
I said, man, I, I can't fix your eye. He said, yeah, that's what I thought. I said, you need to understand, it's the power of Jesus, his love for you, that fixes eyes. Mm, okay. It's the power and love of Jesus that's been healing people in this room, that gave her her hearing. He's like, oh, okay. And I said, bro, what? Your eye is straight. <laughs> he says, what? He does this, turns around, this front row jumps out of their seat. They, they knock their seats over because they looked at, because they seen him. His eye is straight. He looks back at me, runs to the bathroom, is looking, I'm like, he just takes off. He just runs, runs to the bathroom, runs back past me, runs outside, runs around the back of the building. Yeah! Jesus help me! It was so amazing. One of the kids in that group happened to be an atheist. He came up to me after that session was over. And he said, Kevin, um, I want you to understand something. I don't want to be here. I said, yeah, I kind of figured that. He said, no, you don't understand. When I came here, I was an atheist. I said, oh, okay. But his eye got straight. <laughs> I said, yeah, it did. He said, as soon as I saw that happen, I gave my life to Jesus. How cool is that? Here's what I want to challenge you with. We each, as followers of Christ, have the privilege of hosting the Spirit of God. Think about this for a second. When Jesus was baptized, he comes out of the water, and what does the Bible say? It says that the Spirit of God descended upon him like a dove. Okay? Now, we get a picture of a dove, and, you know, doves are cute, pretty, you know, whatever. You dove. That's my Bill Cosby. You <laughs> dove. Just think about this for a second. I don't know a whole lot about doves, but I know doves are skittish. Now think about this. If a dove came in and landed on your shoulder right now, and you wanted to keep it there all day, every step you now take, you take with the dove in mind. The Spirit descends upon us like a dove. Every step from here on out, we have to take with the Spirit in mind. That's the power that we possess. That's the privilege that we hold. We get to do what God does. If Jesus is just coming to earth saying, watch me, watch me, we're just spectators. It, we're impressed by it, but it doesn't really mean that much. But Jesus was saying to us, Oh, I came to demonstrate what life is like for you if you pay attention to what the Father's telling you. Because greater things than these will you do. Amen? Come on up, Dave. God bless you.